you know, Jesus talked about it in some fairly plain terms. You know, he said, I, if I be lifted up, uh, will draw all men unto myself. I think in that instance, he was pointing to the cross. We were studying that in the youth Sabbath school today, this Jesus is uh, the path to the cross. But I think it also means more than that. If Christ is lifted up, if he's presented to the heart and the mind, it does draw people. There's something so appealing about Jesus. And I hope that's what we find every time we open God's word. I also want to give you a a word of encouragement and perhaps even a note of warning along that line. You know, I pray that's what happens in church, that people are drawn closer to the Lord Jesus because of the time we spend in his word. But if this is all that's in your life as far as God's word, it's grossly inadequate, friends. For one thing, you're getting... If this is where you come for your nurturing and all of your feeding, you're getting things secondhand. You need to get it for yourself from God's word. And I want to encourage you to be doing that and remind you that God is no, he's not a respecter of persons. You know, if you ask him for the Holy Spirit and open up his word, he's going to speak to you and you need to be doing that at home. That's the path to a walk of victory for the Christian. It's it's where joy is found, is in spending time with God, spending time in his word. I want to encourage you to do that. We're going to delve into the word today, look at some passages of scripture, and I'm, I'm going to pray that you're blessed. We're going to have a prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. But... Please ask the Holy Spirit to be with you to get into this word. And I think you're going to find things that just places where scripture lights up right now and just touches your heart with a joy and a peace that we all need. Because life is, life's got its difficult places, doesn't it? Uh, tough week. Tough week for our country. Tough week for a lot of our church family. You know, we have things that have not worked out the way we'd hope. Uh, kids that are struggling. People in our midst are struggling financially. Uh, there's issues that life throws in our path that could just derail a person, get you feeling down, really. Uh, flee to Jesus. Spend some time in that word and let him reinfuse you with that that peace that comes from a relationship with him if you join me in prayer you know for the holy spirit's presence we'll we'll have a prayer before we start our study but be praying in your own hearts that he's with you throughout the week that he gives you an appetite for his word that the joy the peace the comfort that's there for us can be your own, you know, and and be with you continually. Let's have a, a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, when we open your word, we do it claiming your promise that the Holy Spirit's available to those that ask. I'm asking today that you guide and direct my words, that you guide and direct our thoughts. We want Jesus to be uplifted and glorified. We want to gain peace, joy, the things that come from a relationship with him. And, you know, that's our goal when we get together and and seek you through your word. I'd ask that be the case today. But for this congregation, I'm asking that it be something that uh, is not just a Sabbath experience, that it happens all week, that you'll be speaking to our heart, showing us things from your word, That'll make Jesus more real to each of us in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Managed to wear a mask throughout Sabbath school. I'm almost, part of me almost wants to ditch Sabbath school for myself because that mask destroys my voice. Do the rest of you experience that? Uh, I must have toxic fumes that emanate from me and then when I rebreathe them, 
just as soon uh, not pursue that line of thought too terribly far, huh? But uh, how long till enough of us are vaccinated and have had it and got some immunity before we can start doing things like getting together and having a sing on Friday nights and uh, getting back closer to normal, huh? Hopefully pretty soon. We have been <clears throat> taking an overview of the book of Jeremiah, and we want to continue that today. We might we'll probably have about two more weeks in Jeremiah, and it's a long enough book, you know that we're not touching things in depth here. This is kind of a, it's a flyover look at the book. And I want to bring us up to chapter 17 today is a chapter we're going to focus on. Just point out to you that this early, after the <clears throat> first eight or so chapters of Jeremiah, you have an, a, a pretty horrific list of Judah's failings. Jeremiah is pointing those out to the people of God. Uh, he does eventually get around to talking about the cure. I see part of that in chapter 17 today, and that's what we're going to be concentrating on. But you have a book that's that's really written to people in, in trouble sometimes. They're on the verge of captivity during Jeremiah's ministry. Many of them will be taken captive. Many probably died, the people he was talking to. Uh, probably the majority of them did. But there's a reason for his pointing out their sins. We'll get around to that today in our Bible study. But I do want to concentrate a little bit more on the solution. And I think that starts to show up really well in Jeremiah chapter 17. I want you to join me there. We're going to read verses 5 through 8 together. Uh, look at some connecting, supporting text in Scripture for our study today. This passage is... It's got some meat here, friends. There's some ideas that uh, I want you to grasp. I'm going to try to flesh them out for you so that you can, you can get a hold of it, something you can sink your teeth into. Verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert. And I think that's a that's a sage bush that uh, Jeremiah is talking about. He'll not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green, shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. First thing that jumped out at me at this passage is what a blessed promise it is for those that trust in the Lord. I mean, that's rich. But there's other things here that we need to deal with. Did you notice that the differentiation between the cursed and the blessed in the midst of a book that is dealing extensively with behavioral issues, with the way a people lives, but the difference between the cursed and the blessed doesn't point back to behavior, doesn't point back to a people's works. The differentiation between the point, the cursed and the blessed at its very root is not their actions, although actions are symptomatic of what takes place in a person's life. It's not behavior, it's relationship again. It's where you stand with the Lord Jesus. Cursed is he that relies on the arm of flesh. Blessed is he that trusts in the Lord. And Jeremiah doesn't differentiate between them and say those that are the blessed of the Lord are those that are doing right. 
those that are cursed are those that are doing wrong. And I think that's for a very particular reason we want to discuss. But do you suppose those that are the blessed of the Lord do their works exhibit that? Can you see it in a Christian's life when they've come to the Lord? When your relationship gets tight with the Lord, you can really see it, can't you? Things change in a person's life. He's talking to a people that assume that they are the Lord's chosen people. You know, they would like to think that they're all blessed. We looked at that in our first discussion of the book of Jeremiah, how God's people said there's no possible way that we can be facing the judgments from the Lord. After all, his temple is with us. We have his law in our midst. We are God's people after all. Jeremiah has gone on an extensive list of pointing out ways in which they don't behave like God's people. But when he gets to defining those that are cursed, contrasting them against those that are blessed, he shies away completely from pointing to works. And I think that's an interesting and a deep concept. You know, he says, cursed is a man that relies on the arm of flesh. That's a state of mind, a person that thinks they can do it themselves. Blessed are those that trust in the Lord. Jeremiah comes back to a very New Testament concept in this, I think, that, that talks, it, it's relationship that matters, isn't it? With the Lord Jesus, blessed are those that trust in the Lord. That's a rather foundational concept throughout Scripture. And I want to look at a New Testament passage with you that I think fleshes this one out beautifully. And that's found in Romans chapter 5. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 together for a while. I think I'd like to start in verse 6. We could. We could back up to verse 1 and not harm ourselves at all, but verse 6. When we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, <clears throat> we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Blessed is he that trusts in the Lord. Cursed is he that relies on the arm of flesh. When we were yet without strength, friends, Christ died for the ungodly. I want you to connect those two in your thinking for this discussion. I don't know that Paul's exactly just reiterating the same thing twice when he says, you know, blessed are or when we were without strength, uh, Christ died for us, and the ungodliness, whether that equates equally with being without strength. And I think the two go together pretty well, and I want to explore that with you in a little bit of depth. Next part of this passage that really grabs me is the contrast between the love that God has for you and I and the love that we're capable of understanding in some ways. You know, Paul goes and makes a point of it. He says, it's a pretty unlikely thing for somebody to die for a righteous man. So said, occasionally somebody will die for a good man. And I got to wondering about what's the contrast between those two? Why does he break the two apart? Because we tend to equate the two, goodness and righteousness. I think a person can be righteous and not necessarily be all that appealing to others, perhaps. A person can live a life that's moral, upright, not do evil things, and still not be somebody that you just genuinely find attractive. 
that you want to be around all the time. A good person, on the other hand. I get the picture of somebody that would give their last dime to, you know, a bum looking for a cup of coffee. That's the kind of person that, the kind of person that actually prepares for those that have got their little sign up at Fred Myers. You know, please help sign and God bless you. Those are good people. People that are a joy to be around. People that look out for the needs of others. Uh, Paul says occasionally someone would even go to the lengths of dying for a good person. You know, we just find they're so helpful. They're, they're more benefit to society perhaps than I am. And, you know, maybe I'd risk dying for a person like that. I question for myself whether I would. But Paul says there are some that have died for a good person. Jesus says, I think it's in John chapter 15, that the ultimate love a man can exhibit is if he dies for one of his friends. You know, greater love, how's he say it? Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's the pinnacle of human love. That's as high as it can get. To die for someone that's that's a friend or family. Jesus, God, on the other hand, dies for those that are what? They're his enemies. The text says that they're without strength. They can do nothing for themselves. They're ungodly when Jesus chooses to die for them. That's a love that's beyond anything that we're capable of expressing, I think. And it's also beyond what we're capable of genuinely understanding. In fact, I keep coming back to the idea in my thinking that just a whole lot of what takes place in the plan of salvation is a mystery to the human mind. It just It's beyond what we can get our mind around, what Jesus has done for us. That's love, a love that should give us an assurance that carries us through hard times like we've experienced in this past week. You know, it's a love that real, it should show us the lengths that God will go to to make sure it comes out all right for you and me, brothers and sisters. You know, he died for us while we were yet without strength. That's what the love of God is like beyond the highest human expression of human love. In spite of that, it seems like in the human mindset, we're unwilling to accept it. We have this tendency to think, God, I'm not worthy of your love. Uh, I don't know, as particularly with unbelievers, you're going to find that often folks will say, well, I need to clean. I'd like to come to church, but I still have some habits I need to give up. You know, I want to clean up my act and then you know, maybe some point down the road, I'd be ready to come to Jesus, be acceptable, uh, have myself cleaned up enough that I could feel at home in his presence. That's, that's insanity. That's, Jesus didn't say, I died for those that have got their act cleaned up. He died for the ungodly. Died for those that were without strength. I think it's why in Jeremiah's passage, he intentionally doesn't mention anything about a person's behavior when he contrasts the cursed and the blessed. It has nothing to do with your behavior, friends. Your behavior is always going to be inadequate. It's always going to fall short of the mark. We're always going to be looking at ourselves and thinking, Lord, I am unworthy. What I want to encourage you in is don't let that sense of unworthiness keep you from partaking of the grace that God wants to so freely offer. You know, he says he died for those that were unworthy, he died for the ungodly, died for those that were without power. That's those that can't clean themselves up, enter his presence. He has to do that work for us for us to experience a relationship with him. Jesus died for those that were without strength. I wonder how many times even believers will 
kind of limp along through a Christian life, um, destitute, depriving themselves in some ways of the blessings, of, the rich blessings of grace that God would lavish on them if they just grasp the fact that their worthiness has nothing to do with it. You know, how could I ask God for that? I'm so unworthy. That's the only thing you have to present, friends, is your great need. You come to God and you say, I am abjectly unworthy. I'm completely unworthy. There's nothing in me that warrants your favor in any way, shape, or form. But thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you came to die for those that were without strength to change their own lives and were completely unworthy of any of your favors. That's the kind of God we serve. One that would die for those that were without strength, for those that were unworthy. I was reading a, um, drawing a blank on the guy's name, it was Jones and Wagner that wrote, that were at the 1888 conference, right? On righteousness by faith, and it was Wagner. I was reading one of Wagner's sermons, and he was talking to this very thing, this, the Christian who states my unworthiness, uh, you know, keeps me out of this in-depth relationship with God. He said this, if I can find it here in my notes. He said, Christians that uh, professing Christ and skimping along depriving themselves are like this. Uh, they feel they're without strength. He says, but they don't feel it half enough said if they would feel it as much as they should, they could experience the blessings of Jesus. They could, that's not the word he used, I'm not seeing it in my notes. But you to experience what Christ has to offer for you, the very basic foundation of the whole process is you have to realize your unworthiness. Problem with some Christians is they feel their unworthiness a little bit, but they still think I've got some strength, I'm gonna clean myself up and deserve what God has to lavish on us as his blessings. It, that's not how it works. We will never deserve it. Through the ages of eternity, I want my crown to be at the feet of Jesus because I don't deserve to wear the thing. You know, if anything comes to us in the way of good, it's because Jesus Christ paid the price for you and I. That's how we experience his blessing not through our worthiness. If we still think we're making progress, friends, if you still think you, quotes, I want you to be growing in grace, but if you still think you are growing in grace, with you being the motive factor behind it, how much is that worth? What does Jeremiah say is the state of the man that relies on the arm of flesh? You know, cursed is the man that relies on the arm of flesh. Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord to do that work. So why all the talk in Jeremiah and really even the New Testament, if probably if you divided it out verse by verse and looked at, particularly in Paul's writings, the verses that talk about righteousness by faith and the way a Christian behaves, I'll bet Paul has more in his writings about Christian behavior than he has about the righteousness by faith. Why all that discussion of how a Christian lives in Scripture if it all boils down to whether you trust flesh or trust God? You know, in Jeremiah's day, what do you suppose he's trying to get through to Judah when he's, he's talking to them about how far they've fallen short of God's ideal for them? What's he trying to break them of? He's trying to break them of their reliance on the arm of flesh. And it's the same thing Paul does when he, he goes from the end of his, his epistles and he starts talking about how a Christian should behave. Sometimes he even touches on things that I wish he just left alone. I mean, Romans 13, when he talks about how you're supposed to behave towards civil authorities and things, it's like, please, Paul. If that wasn't in the scripture, I'd be dodging my income tax. You know, it's, but it's there. 
Paul talks about Christian behavior a lot, but I think he does it to set such a high ideal that it makes us all realize just where we fall in the scheme of things, that how much we can do to contribute to salvation ourselves. We can contribute nothing to our salvation. And Paul makes that super clear here in Romans 5. He said, you were without strength when God justified you. He said, you were ungodly when God justified you. Now, he doesn't leave you there. Thank goodness God doesn't leave us there. That text continues. Skip the part about, you know, dying for a good man and what God did for us. We've discussed that. But if you're justified by his blood, what's justified? What does justified mean? Let's think about that just a little bit because we're going to separate now between the death of Christ and the life of Christ and what the two things do for us. You were justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified just simply means that you were made as just as if you had not sinned in God's eyes. That's a simple way to remember it. The blood of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, provides that for you and I. You've been made right with God. His life, on the other hand, what's it have to say about his life? We shall be saved from wrath through him. That's verse 9. Verse 10 says that we've been reconciled to him. That's the justification. It says we shall be saved by his life. That's an interesting passage in Paul's writings. We shall be saved. What's the tense of that? What's that point to? Is that an accomplished fact or is that something that's going to happen? That it's a continual kind of process that he points to there what the life of Jesus Christ does for us. In my studies, I've been thinking, friends, and stewing on this for a while, and I actually question whether when a person comes to Jesus, you've given your heart completely to him, I question whether that you, you've even got sins written in the book at that stage. You know, David says, blessed is a man that the Lord doesn't impute iniquity to. If you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ, when God looks at you, what does he see? What does he see when he looks at you? He sees Jesus. When he looks at you, there's no sin in that lamb. He's without spot. He's without blemish. God looks at you. He sees a reflection of his son, Jesus Christ. And I don't think that he goes prying around and saying, let's see if we can get past this, this righteous robe that Jesus has put over that, Francine. Let's see if we can find some dirt on her. You know, I think if you've come to Jesus and it's a you're saved by his blood, his death. You're made right with God. You're saved by his life. You're being saved by his life. You're being changed by it. And that's a process that God does in his own time and in his own way. If he was to just take us when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I'm so glad that you've decided to become a Christian. Now here's a list of things that you're going to change if you want to enter the kingdom. This place would be empty today. You know, we'd all be just, we'd be in despair, wouldn't we? Think about your own walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you knew where you'd be and what your struggles would be today when you came to Christ, would you have expected the path that you've walked at all? You know, there's things Jesus shows me in my life today that I wouldn't have recognized a year ago. There's certainly things in in my life that have been left in the past that I would have expected God to deal with. But he doesn't, he doesn't run out of things to save us from as long as we're this side of the kingdom. We're justified by his blood. We're saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved by his life. The promise of that happening is the price he paid. He died for you while you were yet ungodly. While you were his avowed enemy, Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins. Do you suppose he's going to bail on the rest of the agreement? 
do you suppose with our kids and our grandkids that man they got to get their act together there ain't no way God can save them is that how he looks at it if we can get them to Jesus Christ point them to Jesus get them to to accept Christ into their life those things will be taken care of in their life. Ah, I know a lot of you have family, loved ones, kids that haven't made that decision for Jesus or it's not apparent yet in their life. Oh. Don't despair on that. What point did God give up on you? I asked myself, what did he ever give up on me? You know, not as long as that relationship is there. If, if a person can get connected with the Lord Jesus, I think even the, the natural reliance we have on the arm of flesh, I think God can deal with that too. He can take a people that are under that curse, and that is a curse. To try to do it your own way is nothing but frustration. There's no joy in trying to do it your own way. There's no joy in trying to overcome sin on your own. It's just all headache. It's just all defeats, one after another, if you're relying on the arm of flesh. But if you want that relationship with God, you will. He'll see that you learn trust in him. I think sometimes he does that through hard times. I was thinking about it this week, and you know, our nation is going through some hard times, and that affects all of us. I've been I've been disturbed by what happened this week. I'm talking to Glenn, talking to Dad, the this is not an easy thing to watch. And I think it's particularly rough on our our veterans that, you know, serve to keep this nation what it was. They see these things and they think, what is What's gone wrong with this country? Those kind of hard times can chase you back to reliance on something besides the arm of flesh. And you realize that even on a national level, there's nothing humanity can do to fix humanity's problems. It's God that's needed in the equation. We deal with our... Um, we want to deal with our problems ourselves, I guess. I had an experience this week, guys, I think I want to share. I want to be careful with this, but David Davis left us this week to go back to Idaho for a little while, okay? I love that kid. I mean, he's, he's a lot of fun. He's been a tremendous help to our family. When he told me he was thinking of going back to Idaho, and it's temporary, it's for work, my immediate thought was, what a mistake. You know, you're in Alaska is a great place for a young man to be, where the days are getting longer, summer's coming, things are going to change here. And I'm thinking, what a mistake. But I was praying to the Lord, you know, guide, guide David in his decisions. And my mind is saying, keep him here. That's what I was wanting. Uh, I had my beloved ask me, are you going to go have a talk with, with him? Uh, my initial thought was, yeah, I think I, I'd like to do that. And I, but then what would I have been doing? You know, I would have been just encouraging him to do what I think a guy should do. That's not my call to make, is it? That would be your pastor relying on his arm of flesh, what I think was right for the occasion. That's not right. If I've asked God to guide and direct in David's life or in one of my kids' life or grandchildren's life, let God guide and direct. You know, if, if it doesn't go exactly the way we think it should have, could it possibly be because we don't see the picture that God is looking at? 
that we don't see a big enough picture? You know that we're relying on us, on our understanding for how we think things should happen? I, I fought that over in my own head, and I think, you know, let God be God. Let him be God in my life, which means my opinion doesn't count. If I've asked him for his to be worked out, can I trust that it actually will be? You know, I've come to some peace with that. I think that for, and it's not just that one instance. I've got some other heavy things I've been praying about. Uh, let Hand it over to God. If you keep hounding God sometimes on something, even if it's something that's very dear and precious to your heart, uh, perhaps that's a reliance on the arm of flesh. You know, I've asked God to deal with the problems that are in my life. Trust him to do it. He, he loved me enough that he died for me while I was ungodly, completely powerless to do anything about my own condition. That same God is going to save me through his life, and he's going to save those we're praying for through his life. He's at work. He's at work, friends. We can trust God in what, what we see. Is God at work in our nation? You know, maybe what God has shown us is that this is just the results of the seeds that have been planted, this wicked crop that's growing in our world. You know, maybe we have to go through this. Maybe we're a people that's on the verge of the same kind of destruction that Jeremiah was talking about. Maybe hard times are coming to this nation. Can you trust God with it? Can you back off it and say, Lord, your will be done? You know, there's an interesting passage in Jeremiah where Jeremiah's, he actually complains a fair amount to the Lord, it seems like. You know, he says, with weeping and tears. I mean, he's sincere. He loves his people. And God tells Jeremiah, he says, don't, don't pray those prayers no more. And he says, don't pray for this people. Don't, don't pray those prayers no more. He says, I have a plan. You've already asked me, you know, to work that plan out. Trust me to do it. That's what God says to me. I'm encouraging you church family. Let God be God. Remember these kind of little passages. Jeremiah 17. Cursed is the man that trusts in man, maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. He's just going to be a sage bush. A sage bush gets planted wherever the seed happens to land. Doesn't really have much of a future, I don't think. I mean, they aren't even good for cow feed. They're just there until the next wildfire comes through and burns them up. They don't see when good comes, a sage bush. The believer, on the other hand, friend, God has his hand in their life. It says that that tree is planted. Okay? Does a tree plant itself? I mean, this tree has got God's involvement in its life already, and that's the tree that you are. God's involved in your life. You've asked him into your heart, and he has planted you where he wants you. You're next to a stream of living water. When hard times come, you have a source to draw on, and we are seeing hard times. Draw on that source. There's a drought coming. Sure there is. We can see it. Go home, watch the news tonight. The trout may not be just coming. It may be here already. I mean, we could, this time next year, would you have thought we were, we'd be where we are now a year ago? You know, who knows what's coming? Hard times come, but for the Christian, you've been planted next to that living water. Draw from it. Don't rely on something else. Cursed is a man that makes flesh his arm. Blessed, on the other hand, is he that's a tree that's planted next to that river of life. That's us. That's our kids. Make sure they're planted there. Get them connected with God and the rest of it. I think we can trust him for it. I know we can trust him for it. 
Ah, we're going to quit before I get too dingy on you. But Jeremiah has got some interesting things. This particular passage, I'd encourage you to go home like we talked about before we started today. Study on this word yourself. Have a look at it. Have a look at Jeremiah 17. You know, it's in this cursing and blessing, it's separated from works. How long does it take Jeremiah to bounce back to how a Christian would behave? You know, he immediately starts talking about how the Sabbath is important in this passage. But what's Sabbath? What's Sabbath a sign of? Exactly. Sabbath is a sign that I'm the Lord your God that does what? sanctifies you. You know, you see why Jeremiah goes back to that immediately? He's just told us that this relationship with Jesus is everything. If you don't have it, you got nothing. But if you do have it, and you're drawing from that stream of living water, these fruits will continue. They'll you'll not be fruitless. Is that in that passage as well? Jeremiah chapter 17. This tree that's planted by the living waters, it's going to do what? It yields fruit. It yields fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, goodness. All those things that you want to see in your life that you crave when times are hard, when your heart is just up in your throat because of the way things are when you're stressed to the max, when you got a kid that's in trouble, when you have uh, financial issues, when your nation is falling apart around, around your ears, when your own health is failing. For me this week, it was when you got nights where you can't sleep. You know, those things that you just feel quivery inside almost because nothing is going right. You need that love, joy, and peace. You need those fruits of the Spirit. You get those by trusting in the Lord, not by any self-improvement, not by trying to fix it yourself. You get it by trusting in the Lord. Blessed is a man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you give us that reliance, that trust in the Lord. We gravitate back toward wanting to do things ourselves all the time. Always trying to fix problems around us. And motive is good, I guess, but it it's just uh, takes our eyes off of Jesus where it ought to be. We thank you that you give us words like this from your, from the scripture. This uh, contrast between those that are cursed and those that are blessed is just so basic, but so hard to do sometimes. I'd ask that you teach us to trust in you. We want to bear fruit for you and we want to have your fruit in our lives that love joy and peace that list that we so desperately need in hard times uh, it comes from a relationship with you from trusting in you so we know it's something that we have to learn and get better at continue that that work in our life we thank you that you're doing it that uh, you see a bigger picture and that you're preparing a place for us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.